That serial killer whose arms Peggy Joyce Shelton found herself in was Jerry Lee Fletcher. He was born in 1942 in Indianapolis, Indiana. His father, Carl, worked most of his career at Peerless Pump Company, and his mother, Pauline, worked part-time as a cashier at the Porky Lane Supermarket, which was the one of the neighborhood markets in Indianapolis. They have the most adorable mascot, but rebranded from Miss Piggy to Dapper Mr. Pig. Still cute. Jerry's father only finished the sixth grade, and his mother only finished the eighth. They married young, started a family, and worked hard. Jerry is the youngest of three children, and the family lived in the same house from the time he was young on LeGrand Street in Indianapolis. According to Zillow, it's 672 square feet, two bedroom, one bath house. However, if you look at the aerials, it's obviously larger than that. So I think it just hasn't been updated. I really hope so. According to his pre-sentencing report, he didn't get along well with his father, who was an authoritarian type. He had overly strict rules and severely limited the children's activities. At age 15, Jerry's sister ran away from home due to that situation. And it was noted that his mother tried to intervene to protect the children from the father, but was often unsuccessful. The PSI notes that his feelings towards his family at, were negative at that time. Jerry attended public school number 29 in Indianapolis and then Washington High School, which is still around today. He continued through grade 10 before he dropped out at age 17. Someone asked me previously why I give so many details like this that aren't relevant at all to the case. And honestly, it's so people watching can relate to it. You understand better who the person is, but also maybe you lived in Indiana. Maybe you lived in Indianapolis. Maybe you went to public school number 29 and it sparked something in your mind and you're like, oh my gosh, I remember that. It's happened before. It's a lot. You would be surprised how many six degrees of separation there are. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Jerry was intelligent, according to the PSI. He scored a 106 on his IQ test. He stated he just didn't apply himself in school. Um, just to note, of course, I had to look it up. The global average IQ is 100 with an average of 98 in the US. So the US is two points below the global average on IQ. Hmm. And just cause, you know, Massachusetts has the highest IQ average with a score of 104.3. So many comments. I'm just gonna keep them to myself and keep moving. New Hampshire has the second highest with 104.2. And scraping the bottom of the barrel are Louisiana and Mississippi with 95.3 and 94.2, respectively. Yep. Jerry didn't care for school, but he did like driving. When he would have been about 15 or 16, he was charged with taking a car and joyriding. That was the actual charge. <laughs> taking a car and joyriding without permission, of course. He received six months probation. Immediately following his 18th birthday, 1960, Jerry enlisted in the U.S. Army, where he attained the rank of specialist fourth class. His job? A truck driver. It wouldn't last, though. 1963, while stationed in Munich, Germany, Jerry was arrested for transportation of stolen goods. He was turned over to civil authorities and military authorities, and ultimately his disposition was one and a half years in the military dis disciplinary barracks at Fort Leavenworth. The United States Disciplinary Barracks, USDB, is often referred to as the military's only maximum security prison, and it's located in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. It serves as the Department of Defense's only long-term maximum security correctional facility. The USDB houses military prisoners who have been sentenced to confinement as a result of court-martials, typically for serious offenses under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It was established in 1874 and has a long history of providing custodial care for military prisoners. Over the years, it has evolved to meet changing security and correctional standards, and the facility accommodates inmates from all branches of the military, including the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard. 
It should not be confused with Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, which I didn't know this and apparently confused them frequently throughout my life, which is also located in Leavenworth, Kansas, and is one of the oldest and most well-known federal prisons in the United States. It was established in 1895 and operated until 2005 when it was closed down. That Leavenworth housed notorious criminals throughout history, including Al Capone and George Machine Gun Kelly. For anyone watching at home that isn't aware, that is not the Machine Gun Kelly that is dating Megan Fox. Just putting that out there. The prison was known for its strict regime and high security measures. It gained a reputation for being tough and austere facility and often depicted in popular culture. Though no longer operational, its legacy remains as a symbol of the federal prison system in the United States. After only 11 months and 27 days of his 18-month sentence, Jerry was released. He was also dishonorably discharged from the Army on February 12, 1964. I attempted multiple times to obtain copies of Jerry's military documents, records, his court-martial, to see exactly what was going on and what his charges were. The problem was is they were unable to find any record that he even existed. There could be a million different reasons for this, but I'm pretty sure it relates to the fire. And anyone who knows anything about military records, it's just called the fire. It was 1973, St. Louis, Missouri, at the National Personnel Records Center, which is part of the National Archives and Records Administration. A massive building filled with paper, valuable papers that are archived and saved for eternity until the fire came. The fire was believed to have destroyed between 16 and 18 million official military personnel records, primarily the Army and Air Force. The fire of, in the building took four days to get under control, and it took a month for them to finish putting out the hot spots. Since 80% of the records related to Army veterans who had been discharged were destroyed at that point, I'm going to say that that's what happened. And it is what it is. Fortunately, we were able to get a lot of information from his PSI, which was contained in the court records for one of his other cases. And I was able to determine that the reason for his discharge from the army, he would receive the dishonorable discharge, and it was a conviction under the Dyer Act. The Dyer Act was formerly known as the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act, and it's a United States federal law enacted in 1919 and named after the sponsor, L.E. Dyer of Missouri. And the primary purpose of the Dyer Act is to address interstate transportation of stolen motor vehicles and related offenses. The Dyer Act prohibits several activities related to stolen vehicles, including interstate transportation of a motor vehicle aircraft vessel, knowing it has been stolen, converted, or taken by fraud, aiding or abetting the interstate transportation of a stolen vehicle, receipt, possession, concealment, or disposal of a stolen vehicle that has been transported across state lines. The law was passed to combat the increasing problem of automobile theft and the transportation of them across state lines, which was facilitated by the rise of the automobile inter industry and interstate travel. It provides federal jurisdiction over these offenses, allowing the prosecution in federal courts, especially when stolen vehicles cross state lines. It's been amended and updated over the years to adapt to changes in technology and criminal methods related to vehicle theft. So disgraced, Jerry returned to Indiana, and by 1965, he was living in Greenwood, which is a suburb of Indianapolis, working as a press operator. In November of that year, he married his first wife, Gloria. The marriage announcement in the newspaper listed his parents' home in Indianapolis as the couple's address. Jerry also changed jobs around that time, working as a mechanic at the General Hospital in Indianapolis. Two months after the marriage, a son was born, which explains a little bit. The marriage only lasted a year and a half before the wife filed for divorce and Jerry ended up in Tampa working for a construction company. But by 1968, he was back in Indianapolis working for RCA, and he found himself 
in trouble with the law again when he received a second auto theft charge under the Dyer Act. However, despite the law being touted as having harsh penalties for auto theft, Jerry only received two years of probation. But since the Dyer Act is a federal offense, he was on federal probation, which is a little bit harsher, but still. He met and married wife number two in August, and the recorded address was again his parents' home. In the PSI, he noted a poor relationship with them, but it seems like he kept going back to them. I should note that he didn't exactly step into the role of fatherhood either. It didn't take long before he and wife number two started having problems. Just months into their marriage, the pair were arrested on theft charges. At least by this point, they had their own address. Um, the couple was charged with first-degree burglary of money and merchandise totaling $700, which would have been over $6,000 today, including about $75 in quarters, which would have been about $75 today. A diamond ring and a camera. The homeowner returned during the course of the burglary and scared the couple off, but they were quickly tracked down by authorities as they were believed to have broken into multiple houses in the area around that time. They were each held on a $10,000 bond, which would have been just under $90,000 today. Eventually, the wife was given a one to five year suspended sentence and placed on probation, meaning for the next year, she had to complete probation six. The next year, she had to complete probation successfully and stay out of trouble or she would have to serve the full sentence. Otherwise, it would go away. Jerry was sentenced to a two to 14 years sentence in the Indiana State Prison. He ended up going to Pendleton State Prison, which is in Michigan City. Michigan City is all the way up at the tippy top on Lake Michigan at the border of Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. After not even two and a half years, Jerry was released on June 30th, 1971. While he had been incarcerated, his parents purchased a small cluster of efficiency apartments that was formerly called a motor court. They called it a hotel. It was located on Nebraska Avenue in Tampa. You remember my description of Nebraska Avenue, right? Jerry reported working there on his PSI, although I'm unsure how reliable that information is because he said he was working at the construction company in Tampa the entire time he was incarcerated. However, it seems that Jerry went running to mommy and daddy after getting out of prison and a lot for someone who doesn't really like them. Jerry wasn't the only one headed to Tampa in June of 1971. The Justy family from Saugerties, New York, a small town in the Catskills, also relocated to the Sunshine State. Mr. Justy was a disabled veteran who was out of work, and Miss Justy worked to support the family of six children. They settled in the town and country area of Tampa. This is a residential community conveniently located northwest of downtown. It has a lot of roadways, providing easy access to get pretty much anywhere you need to go. And while the area has grown substantially since the 70s, it's still primarily residential. I'm quite familiar with the area as Gina's home was located less than five miles from where I lived at one time. One day, Gina had heard that a man in the neighborhood was giving away puppies and she wanted to go see them. The puppies were located about three miles away from her home on West Patterson Street. I don't believe these roads were even constructed yet in the 1970s, and there is a notation in her file that she was walking down Hillsborough Avenue. Unfortunately, she never made it. The following day, a worker found her body. It was in an orange grove over 14 miles away from where the puppies were. She had been assaulted, essayed, and strangled with a leather string. There was an odd puncture wound in her back that was originally thought to be a gunshot. There was no effort made to conceal her body. The man who owned the puppies was questioned and ruled out as a suspect. Gina's brother and father were looked at closely for a very long time before finally being ruled out. It wasn't long before the case stalled. There was a group of four young men whose names kept coming up during the investigation. 
However, there was no evidence at all to tie them to Gina's murder. The following year, Gina's brother died in a car crash, dealing the family another tragic blow. And less than 10 miles east of Gina's home, Jerry decided to quit working for his parents and began working for Bud Wilmoth Trailer Sales right there on Nebraska. Everything was kind of just within a very half a mile. This is September 1971. This may have been where he met Peggy Joyce Nelson, a Kentucky woman who fled an abusive relationship, came to Tampa for a fresh start. Joyce was living in a trailer at the Pelican Court Trailer Park on Nebraska. They may have met at a local bar. At, at this point, it's unclear. What is known is that they were married in Tampa at the Hillsborough County Courthouse on December 15th, 1971. Getting married didn't keep Jerry out of trouble, though. He was arrested in February of 1972 for attacking a woman at a Tampa diner. The young woman went outside to use the restroom. It was one of those buildings where the restrooms were located outside, like at a gas station. Jerry grabbed the young woman and pulled her into the back of his car and assaulted her. Miraculously, the girl was able to get away. Unfortunately, though, she never saw justice. Jerry was ultimately acquitted of all charges. And it's unclear whether Joyce knew about this at the time, but as his wife, it would be hard to believe that she didn't. Perhaps that's what they were fighting about on that weekend of July 15th. That hot summer weekend, something happened to trigger Jerry. Something happened to make him viciously beat Joyce, viciously beat and strangle her to death, his wife, the woman he married, and then wrap her in a pineapple damask bedspread, probably from the trailer she was living in, the one she was renting on Nebraska Avenue that likely had bunk beds in it. Maybe she had hopes that at some point, she'd be able to get her sons back, but something set Jerry Fletcher off, and he ended any chance of Joyce finally finding happiness. He drove her to an isolated area in the wildlife preserve in Brooksville, Florida, and dumped her in the scrub on the side of the dirt road. By the end of 1972, Joyce was buried in a grave marked as a Jane Doe, and detectives were no closer to determining her identity. Jerry had left his job at a trucking company and returned to Indiana. Although when he was involved in a traffic accident in Greenwood, Indiana, he listed his home address as Tampa. He then took a job with ElectroPaint, an industrial painting company out of Indiana, where they sent him out on big jobs for weeks at a time. And then he would come home and have a week off. They painted very large equipment and office furniture, things like that. He was assigned to a job in Peoria, Illinois at the end of March, 1973. Karen, and her name really is Karen, I'm not just calling her that, decided to go out on the evening of April 19th, 1973, and asked 13-year-old Shirley McCune to babysit for her. Karen, along with two male friends, headed to the local tavern in Lacken, Illinois. While not significant, I wanted you to note that neither of the two men Karen went to the the bar with that night were her husband. She was married at the time, but her husband was incarcerated. For shooting her first husband, I was unable to find sources to this story, but this is noted in the court filing that she married the man that shot her first husband and now he is in prison for that crime. So, also at the bar that evening was Jerry Fletcher, who was seen by one of the two men playing pool. Late that night or early the next morning, presumably when the tavern closed, Karen and the two men headed to an unspecified location in Peoria to continue the party. Around 4 a.m. on what would have been April 20th, Karen left the two men to go buy more beer. Eventually, one of them went looking for her after a while when she didn't return, and they found her standing next to a tan-colored work van speaking to a man, Jerry Fletcher. Now, it's 30 to 40 minutes drive between the town of Lacken, where the tavern was, and Peoria, depending on which part you're going to. What are the odds that the guy from the tavern 30 miles away shows up at the same after party at four o'clock in the morning. After the friend walked up, 
Jerry and Karen continued their conversation for a few minutes, and Jerry propositioned Karen. Karen declined, and then Karen and the men headed back to her home at a trailer park in Sparland. They arrived home about 6 a.m., and by this point, they were all quite intoxicated. One of the men stayed and passed out in the car, while Karen and the other men man went inside. They immediately fell asleep on the couch. Neither checked on the babysitter or the children at that point in time. The next morning, when the man that was sleeping on the couch woke up, he didn't see the babysitter anywhere, but her shoes, jacket, and panties were reportedly laying on the floor by the dining room table. Surely, the babysitter often left in the early hours of the morning and walked home. So Karen assumed this is what had happened and went on with her day. The following day, April 21st, Patrolman Ronald Hines of the Peoria City Police Department, that's a tongue twister, heard the dispatcher send two cars to the area of Route 150 near the Swan Lake Cemetery to check the area for an accident involving a pedestrian. He was nearby and went to the area to look for the injured person. And when he arrived at the cemetery, he wasn't able to find the address that they had called out, but he eventually found a body laying approximately four feet from the guardrail and several people standing around. He asked the bystanders if someone had been hit by a car, if someone was injured, and a man identified as Mr. Rosa. He didn't respond, but he just pointed to the body. So the patrolman went down to the body and saw that it was a young white female and that there was no signs of life. There was a scarf wrapped around her neck and her wrists. Her head was covered with blood and all she had on was a purple looking top and a bra that had been cut. Patrolman Hines immediately called his supervisor and the coroner to the scene. It turns out that the witnesses were part of a funeral procession and when they were entering Swan Lake Cemetery they saw something along the side of the road but they didn't stop at that time. After the funeral they went back to look and they found the body and called police. Mrs. Rosa, who was there, had just buried one of her sons and became incredibly upset at the scene, so the patrolman sent them home after taking a very brief statement. Law enforcement was able to determine that the body belonged to Shirley McCune of Sparland, a town approximately 25 miles north, who had been reported missing the prior day when she didn't return home from a babysitting job. Everyone was obviously devastated by the crime, but they had no indication of who might have done it. Then, several days later, a Mr. and Mrs. Hill, who lived in a mobile home park in Peoria. I want to stop and make a note on terminology because it's really confusing. So there's RV, there's trailer, there's mobile home, manufactured home, and even modular home. And they're used interchangeably, which actually each one is a different thing, and I'm not sure if they're being used properly in this case, as I'm taking them directly from the documentation from the 70s, but for future reference, if I'm using them, this is what they're referring to. An RV is something that you drive that has a place to sleep and stuff in the back. I mean, unless it's a camper van, a van with a bed in the back, but an RV is, you know what an RV is. A travel trailer, is something that you pull behind your vehicle. Think like an Airstream. A fifth wheel is a travel trailer that has a special hitch that goes up and over onto a special hitch <laughs> that is uh, mounted into the bed of a truck. Now a trailer, mobile home, manufactured home, that is what we refer to as the living one. You know, we have a single wide, a double wide. You could even get a triple wide these days. That's, that's where you live. They manufacture these off-site. And it, interestingly, they are manufactured to the standards, but it is federal standards that govern how mobile manufactured homes are, are done. That's a whole nother story. Anyways, then they are brought to the site. The tongue of the trailer, the, um, sorry, the axle is not removed. It stays on there. So the home is able to be transported no matter what. They're put on some kind of foundation, elevated foundation, and there you go. A modular home is built almost identical to the trailer mobile home, manufactured home, off-site. However, 
it has to comply with building codes that are state mandated. So there are some extra things that have to be done. Like in Florida, you have to have some extra straps from the ceiling to the, the roof straps and a couple other things. They are put on a permanent foundation, so they can't be moved once they're put in place. That is a modular home. And I think that covers all of them. So as I was saying, Mr. or Mrs. Hill had been on a week-long vacation. When they returned home on April 25th, they found blood stains on and around a bed in their trailer. Mobile home, manufactured home. They also found that a brand new meat cleaver that had never been unwrapped or used was washed and put away while they were gone. The police inspected and noted that the telephone wires had been cut to their property and there were pry marks on the outside rear door. Their home should have been vacant in their absence. And oddly, Mr. Hill found a newspaper cutout of a classified advertisement from a 1962 Chevy 2. The police began questioning um, the surrounding neighbors in the mobile home park where the Hills lived, which it was only a short distance from the cemetery where Shirley McCune's body had been found just a couple days earlier. Because of the blood and the, the oddness of the crime, detectives showed Mrs. Hill the blankets that Shirley's body had been wrapped in, and she was able to identify them as coming from her home. Lab tests later revealed that the blood type of the stains in the Hill's home was O, which was the same as Shirley's, and that was about as advanced as their technology got back then. Through their investigation, police searched the trailer directly across from the Hill's they ended up locating a screwdriver in a dresser drawer beneath a pile of clothing. That trailer was being rented by Jerry Fletcher and Wayne Sutton, one of Fletcher's co-workers. A tool mark expert would later posit positively identify it as the cause of the pry marks on the hill's rear door. The screwdriver itself belonged to a third man that worked at ElectroPaint who stayed in his own camper van at another location, but worked every day with Jerry Fletcher. Wayne Sutton was questioned by authorities and indicated that on the 19th, they finished work around 10.30 p.m. and headed to a gas station where they filled up the tank of the van and cleaned the windows. Fletcher, Sutton, and the third man went to the tavern, but the third man left around midnight. Sutton was unsure when they left, but Jerry drove him back to the trailer and dropped him off, then drove away. Sutton said the next morning the van was parked outside the trailer with three quarters of the gas tank empty and bugs all over the windshield. Jerry arrived to work around 8 a.m. and said he had taken a cab to work. Later that day during lunch, Jerry took the van again, saying he wanted to go look at a used car that he was very interested in purchasing a 1962 Chevy 2. At this point, investigators used the Chevy ad found at the Hills home along with the screwdriver tool mark match to connect Jerry Fletcher to the break-in. He was charged with burglary, but not Shirley's murder. Despite the fact that she was wrapped in the blanket stolen from the Hills home and strangled and bound with a sash from one of Mrs. Hill's dresses. Part of the reason could have been that he was administered a polygraph test and passed. He was a true psycho. Jerry was arrested and released on bond, so he ended up losing his job and returning to Indiana. Back at that time, there wasn't communication between di different states, different districts about bond and violations and things like that. So punishments were a lot less, I would say. Because May 1973, right after everything else happened, Jerry got in trouble again back in Indiana, this time for drinking and malicious damage to property. This is while he was on bond for the burglary charge. He later told authorities that he had formed a severe drinking problem in the recent years, and he smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, but he was emphatic that he had no experience with narcotics. He was placed on a three-month probation for the disorderly charge, and he violated it a week later when he missed one of his appointments. He bounced back pretty quick, though. As a month later, he married his fourth wife. She was a single mother of two young boys and was blind. 
On this marriage license application, Jerry lists his previous marriages as one, although he had been married three times, and he indicated that he had no children, although he had a son. He lists his occupation as a truck driver, even though he was unemployed, and his prior job before that as a painter. During the interview on the PSI, a short time later, Jerry admitted to his first two marriages and his son, but omitted any mention of Joyce. So Jerry continued to play house with wife number four and his two stepchildren until January 1974 when the FBI caught up with him back home in Indiana where he was held on a $150,000 bail. That's just under a million dollars in today's money. Jerry was transported back to Illinois where he sat in jail awaiting indictment, which did not come until April, April 30th actually. And the grand jury indicted Jerry Fletcher on one count of murder and one count of indecent liberties with a child. Three witnesses were listed on the indictment. Ronald Edwards of the Peoria County Jail, Detective Robert Burns with the Illinois State Police, and Larry Lorschbaugh with the Illinois Bureau of Identification. Apparently, while Jerry was in county lockup, he got a little loose-lipped and admitted to the murder while speaking with Ronald Edwards. He said it happened after a SEX party, according to Edwards' testimony. A week after his indictment, the state asked for a 60-day continuance. The main reason being Mr. Sutton, Wayne Sutton, the co-worker Jerry shared the trailer with in Peoria was MIA. Mr. Sutton had given authorities an Indianapolis address but could not be located. So around this same time, investigators in Pinellas County, Florida, received a new lead in the very similar murder of Gina Marie Justy. They were finally able to bring charges, first-degree murder charge, in fact, against a 20-year-old man named Mark Donahue. Donahue was described in the Tampa Tribune newspaper at the time as a Dunedin High School dropout who worked at his family's landscaping business occasionally. I want a job where I work occasionally. <sighs> he would have been a few years older than Gina at the time of her death, but Gina's family did not know Donahue and had no idea why he would target her daughter. Pinellas County Sheriff's Department Captain Lou Kubler told the Tribune, they believed there was more than one person involved and they were still investigating the case. This aligned with the prior theory that it was a group of individuals. At the end of May, when Jerry Fletcher's case still had not gone to trial, his defense attorney asked if he was in Fulton County. Sorry. His defense attorney asked for a dismissal based on the defendant's right to a speedy trial having been violated. Of course, that motion was denied. One thing that future generations are going to have that we don't is preservation of records. It was incredibly difficult to find a lot of the records in this case because many had been destroyed. And one thing that was included in the FOIA packet was a transcript of the motion hearing where the state asks for the continuance. And also for the burglary case that Jerry was originally arrested on and the murder case where the indictment came almost a year later by the grand jury to be consolidated. It's pretty interesting to actually hear the way things were done back then. So many things are the same, but yet there's a lot of things that are different. A 60-day continuance was ultimately granted and the trial proceeded at the end of June, 1974. The jury consisted of seven women and five men. They sat through eight days of testimony, all circumstantial as was printed in the Streeter Times Press at the close of the trial. The jurors received specific instructions on the law regarding circumstantial evidence. Fletcher testified on his own behalf and stated that he had engaged the services of a prostitute on the evening of April 18th. He stated that he had left the van at the trailer he shared with Sutton and his lady friend picked him up. Fletcher indicated he took a cab to work the following morning. He also testified that during his lunch break, he took the work van to go look at a car advertised for sale. A witness was able to confirm he spent 15 to 20 minutes looking at a car the following day. The jury didn't buy it and convicted Fletcher on both counts. He would face a sentence of 14 or more years in prison, and he was actually pretty lucky. He committed this murder in April, and in November of that same year, the law changed to allow the death sentence for a murder involving a child.
even though the new law was in place at the time of Fletcher's trial, it was not the law in effect at the time of his crime. So he was sentenced under the prior law. He ultimately received consecutive sentences of 50 to 100 years for the murder and 40 to 120 for the indecent liberties charge. Then, of course, the appeals began. When Fletcher started his appeal process, Mark Donahue was released on a $50,000 bond for the same crime in Pinellas County. He maintained his innocence and tried to get the case dismissed, but a trial was set for the fall. Then it was delayed because the medical examiner decided to go on vacation. You know, priorities. Jerry wrote several letters to the court, anxious for an appeal. He also maintained his innocence and claimed he was railroaded. His public defender filed a motion for a new trial, citing the following reasons. The evidence was insufficient to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant did not receive a fair trial. The defendant was denied due process of law. The defendant was denied equal protection under the law. The people failed to prove every material allegation in the indictment. The court erred in restricting the defendant's counsel in voir dire, examination of prospective jurors. The court erred in granting too much liberty to the prosecution during the voir dire examination of the jury. The court erred in permitting numerous questions by the prosecution during the presentation of evidence over objection by the defendant. The court erred in denying defendant's counsel the right to ask various questions during the presentation of evidence. The court erred in admitting certain exhibits over the objection of the defense. The court erred in denying the defendant's motion for a directed verdict at the close of the people's evidence. The court erred in denying the defendant's motion for a directed verdict at the close of, oh, at the close of all the evidence. The court erred in giving certain jury instructions presented by the people over the defendant's objection. The court erred in refusing certain jury instructions tendered by the defendant. The prosecutor's closing argument was inflammatory and prejudicial, included statements made in context, which prohibited defendant from objecting without prejudice to himself in the eyes of the jury. The court erred in permitting the prosecution to ask various questions of various witnesses under circumstances which prohibited the defendant from objecting without prejudice to himself in the eyes of the jury. The jury verdict was contrary to both law and the evidence. The court erred in denying defendant the right to introduce evidence related to his Polygraph examination, the results thereof at the insistence of the Illinois State Police, despite the fact that defendant presented an offer of proof to the effect that he could prove that he had taken and passed the lie detector test pertaining to the material allegations in the subject matter of the indictment, and that such error was aggravated by the weakness of the people's evidence. I'll let you guess what happened to that motion. Jerry kept appealing, and Mark Donahue was still in Florida waiting for his trial. Then in March of 1975, after five separate delays in the trial of Mark Donahue for the murder of Gina Justy, Circuit Judge David Seth Walker dismissed the case against Donahue. The reason? The state was unable to provide a key witness, just like in Jerry's trial. Except in Jerry's Illinois trial, the judge accepted the prior recorded statement as evidence. In Donahue's case, without the witness, the state did not have a strong enough case to prosecute. The missing witness, whose name was Lee Diamond, was thought to have fled the area for Canada to evade several warrants he was facing. And just like that, Gina's case was cold again. And at this point, Joyce was still a Jane Doe in a potter's field in Florida. The appellate court heard Fletcher's case in 1976. Presiding Justice Stengel delivered the opinion on July 29th. Following a jury trial, defendant was found guilty of murder and indecent liberties with a child. Consecutive sentences of 50 to 150 years for murder and 40 to 120 years for indecent liberties were imposed. The issues presented to this court were whether the evidence was sufficient to prove defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, whether results of a polygraph examination taken by defendant were improperly excluded, and whether the trial court erred by refusing to give the second paragraph of the IPI criminal number 3.02. The Illinois Pattern Jury Instructions 3.02 relates to circumstantial evidence. They don't really explain the argument regarding the circumstantial evidence, but what it was was each side presented their proposed jury instructions. The state presented just one paragraph regarding circumstantial evidence, and the defense presented two. The state wanted the standard paragraph read, circumstantial evidence is the proof of facts or circumstances which give rise to a reasonable inference or other facts which tend to show the guilt or innocence of the defendant. Circumstantial evidence should be considered by you together with all the other evidence in the case in arriving with your verdict. Now, the defense wanted this additional sentence read as well. 
You should not find the defendant guilty unless the facts and circumstances proved exclude every reasonable theory of innocence. And that sentence was not read despite the defense asking for it. So that is one of the one of the bases for appeal. The appeals court ruled that the evidence here clearly shows that the victim was taken to the Hill trailer, which was across from the defendant's trailer. A classified ad for a car in which the defendant had been interested in was found in the Hill trailer. Moreover, the defendant had clipped an ad for that particular car and had carried it with him. A microscopic comparison by a qualified expert revealed that pry marks on the Hill trailer door were made by a screwdriver found underneath the defendant's clothing in a chest of drawers. The fact that the van which the defendant drove on the night in question had used three quarters of a tank of gas and was covered in bugs is consistent with the driving necessary to go between Peoria and Sparland and contradicts the defendant's testimony he remained in Peoria. There is also testimony of Ronald Edwards regarding statements made by the defendant while incarcerated. Although such testimony is ordinarily suspect and is viewed with caution, regarding the conviction for indecent liberties, a swab revealed the presence of intact swimmies. Although medical testimony was unable to determine how recently intercourse had taken place, the victim was age 13 and was found nude from the waist down. Her brassiere had been cut in two. In the absence of contrary evidence, we believe these facts support the finding that Miss McCune's murderer also committed the offense of indecent liberties. Yes, that is applying common sense to the, to the circumstance, for sure. Accordingly, we find the evidence is sufficient to support the convictions in Illinois as well. It is well established that results of polygraphic examinations are inadmissible absent a stipulation by both parties. The court provided multiple citations and Supreme Court cases to support this. The final issue concerns the circumstantial evidence. Apparently, the trial court refused to read the second paragraph of IPI criminal number 3.02. That's the one I just read. The defendant contends that there was no direct evidence with regard to the indecent liberties charge. The committee contends to this instruction provided that the second paragraph should only be given when proof of guilt is entirely circumstantial in determining whether this paragraph is appropriate. Any admissions by the defendant are to be considered as direct evidence. In this case, Edwards testified that the defendant stated he had killed Ms. McCune after a SEX party. In addition, there was evidence regarding the victim's age and the presence of stuff I can't talk about on YouTube without getting in trouble. After thoroughly considering all the matters assigned and argued in this court, we conclude that the defendant had a fair trial free from prejudicial error according to the judgments and convictions of the Circuit Court of Peoria County are affirmed. Appeal denied. Judgment upheld. And life went on. Jerry Fletcher was left to rot in the Menard Correctional Institution. Gina's family went on with their lives the best they could with a huge piece missing. They tried to keep Gina's case alive, but there wasn't much that could be done with it. There was no new information coming. Her parents eventually gave up hope and went to their graves not knowing who took their daughter away from them. And Peggy Joyce Shelton was in a potter's field under a tag saying Jane Doe. It would be that way for 35 years. The first change came when an investigator assigned to Gina Justy's cold case received a phone call from the lab telling him that there had been a hit on DNA processed from the 40-year-old cold case. Until this point, there had only been a partial DNA profile, which had run through the national database the year prior. The forensic laboratory operated by the Pinellas County Medical Examiner's Office decided to try again to obtain a sample from Gina's clothing, which was still preserved in evidence. The process used was more advanced than the prior attempts, and they were finally successful. It was not a full profile, but it was enough to run through the national database. A few days later, they received a letter from Illinois indicating the DNA submitted matched a convicted offender. Detectives flew from Florida to Dixon, Illinois to meet with Jerry Fletcher. He met with them willingly, spoke to them about his past, his whereabouts at certain times. Then when he found out the specific purpose of the interview, he stopped talking. He didn't admit any involvement in Gina's death or any other crimes, despite the fact that his appeal had been denied and there was no chance of him getting out of prison. But his confession wasn't needed in this case. His DNA was, he had lived in the area. He had been convicted of a similar crime in another state. 
So Jerry Lee Fletcher was indicted on first degree murder charges in Pinellas County, Florida for the death of Gina Marie Justy in 2011. Gina's older brother was shocked to hear the news. He said he wished it had come three years sooner so his mother could have known. He said his sister's death drained the life right out of her, which is understandable. Fletcher was eventually transported to Florida to stand trial. The state's attorney said at the time, even though Jerry had no chance of getting out of prison in Illinois, as it was, it was important to prosecute Gina's case. The citizens and her family deserved a resolution of some kind. Detective Mike Bailey spoke to Fletcher prior to his trial. He asked him if there was other victims, having a strong suspicion that there were. Fletcher cryptically seemed to agree and said, take the death penalty off the table and maybe we can talk. August 9th, 2013, Fletcher pled guilty to Gina's murder. He was sentenced to the maximum 100 years in prison on top of the 90 years he was already serving in Illinois. He did receive credit for his 134 days served in the Pinellas County Jail, though, so don't worry about that. He got, a, he got his due. But since the death penalty was off the table, Mike Bailey went and visited Fletcher and reminded him of their agreement. Fletcher, being the piece of human trash he is, laughed, used a few four-letter words, and said he was a liar. He's not just a liar. He's a total piece of garbage who doesn't deserve to breathe, which apparently someone else noticed because Jerry Fletcher died the following year in the Illinois State Prison of Natural Causes. But this was 10 years too soon for him to also be convicted of killing his wife of six months, Peggy Joyce Shelton, who was trying to escape a life of hell only to walk straight into the arms of a evil monster. Whether she met him at a bar, at a trailer sales lot where he worked, hitchhiking down the road, Jerry no doubt saw Joyce's vulnerability and insecurities from the abuse she had suffered. Like the predator he is, he likely charmed her with a smooth talk. Probably wasn't hard. She was damaged. Then one day, she pushed the wrong button. Or maybe he just went off because he was that evil. Maybe he was just that much of a psychopath that he killed her because he wanted to, not because he was angry. Although, he must have always been angry to have that much rage and hate deep down to have beaten all three of these women so viciously to their face and head. What triggered it? What was the original cause? They always say that there's something. It reminds him of something. It makes him think of something. Peggy was looking for a new life, looking to start over. And Jerry brutally beat her, just like Gina, just like Shirley, just like his ex-wives probably like other unsolved cases or Jane Doe's that I haven't found yet that fell victim to his wrath. Who did he hate so much that he transposed his anger on these poor, innocent young girls and women? Imagine the damage he could have done if his coworkers hadn't ratted him out. I really wish Peggy could have gotten her justice. It seems unfair that she lived such a short, tortured life, but I try to take solace in the fact that she is at peace now. She has her name back, and her son has the answers he should have had many years ago. And Jerry Fletcher is rotting in the flaming pits of hell as we speak. If anyone has any information on anything related to Jerry Fletcher, if you knew anyone who knew him, please contact the detective, Detective George Lloydgren, with the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. No telling how many other victims are out there. If there are, we need to find them. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate your support as always. Until next time. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, Gina Marie Justy's case was featured on the, I believe it's Investigation Discovery series, Swamp Murders. I would highly suggest watching it if you have any interest at all in the case. It's very interesting. Um, Gina Justy was a 14-year-old girl uh, from Hillsborough County, uh, lived in town and country, um, was going to look at some puppies actually on the 6th of uh, August 1971 and um, was never seen again. Uh, she was found uh, deceased in Pinellas County on the 7th of August 1971.
um, in the area of uh, Tampa Road and County Road 39, 39 which is uh, at that time was a large orange grove, uh, which is now Seavers Landing's uh, uh, neighborhood. Um, she was uh, strangled and was the victim of sexual battery prior to her death. Through the, the, the DNA, uh, we learned that the suspect in this case was a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Jerry Fletcher, who's currently incarcerated um, in Illinois for a very similar type of case. Um, he was arrested um, for the abduction and murder of a um, 13 or 14 year old girl um, in uh, Peoria, uh, Illinois. In 1973, he went into custody in 1974 and has been in custody that, uh, since that time. There was evidence in this case which, which would directly link the suspect to this case. So that's another aspect of this that you look at. What was that evidence? There was a, um, a safe, um, which is commonly what we do nowadays. N-H-U-I-S and it's pronounced Neen Heis and I think you know I'm the sheriff of Fernando County. The first part of our press conference today, we're going to talk a little bit about a case that uh, <clears throat> a couple weeks ago uh, marked its 52nd anniversary here at the Sheriff's Office. Actually back in 1972 we found the body of a young woman uh, out by the interstate and um, you know our major case unit they're tasked with finding obviously justice for victims as well as for families and they investigate our most serious crimes. And we, we take that responsibility personally. Our detectives uh, work cases anywhere from days uh, to months, to years, to decades. And they do so with the goal of finding uh, resolution for the families and hopefully justice. And it can be very, very frustrating for everybody involved uh, especially the loved ones, we understand that. They expect and of course deserve rapid resolution. But we have to investigate these cases with extreme care, uh, with dedication, and with professionalism uh, that will allow us to have successful prosecution if able. And I think you've heard me say before, once an arrest is made, we only have one opportunity to prosecute the case due to things like double jeopardy and speedy trial that can sometimes get in the way if an agency moves too quickly. And I know my mom used to say that the wheels of justice turn exceedingly slow, they do turn exceedingly fine, and law enforcement agencies, they never forget and they never give up. Now this particular case that we're talking about actually started July 19th, 1972, where we had an unidentified female that was found in a heavily wooded area of Hernando County. She was uh, strangled and she was wrapped in a fairly unique blanket and over the years we put that blanket out trying to find leads on this particular case. And again, the body was disposed of in the woods. <clears throat> Just recently, within the last couple years, and I'll probably have Detective Logan talk a little bit more about the specifics of that, but a couple years ago, she was identified as Peggy Joyce Shelton. And through our investigation, we determined that she actually married an individual. His name was Jerry Lee Fletcher back in December 18th. Uh, it was December, yeah, December 18th, 1971, and this is the individual that she married, and this is a picture from that era. His date of birth was um, March 22nd of 1942. Again, his name is Jerry Lee Fletcher. Fortunately for us, after finding out her identity and putting the information out uh, of her identity, we got information that she was actually married to this individual via a marriage certificate uh, in Hillsborough County. <clears throat> and it's important to note that there's no record anywhere of a divorce between these two individuals. Now going back in time, around the time that they were married, uh, Jerry 
Fletcher's parents actually owned a roadside motel uh, down in uh, Hillsborough County on Nebraska Avenue, specifically 7208 Nebraska Avenue. And they owned that motel from 1970 to 1973. And it has eight small cottages, and they advertised them as fully furnished. This actually was listed as Jerry's residence just prior to his marriage to Peggy. And Peggy's body was wrapped in a blanket or comforter, and it was twin size, that would commonly be found in this type of motel. And a resident of this motel, in fact, actually told detectives that he had actually had stayed there and had a twin size bed uh, because the rooms were so small they couldn't fit anything larger than that. A textile expert has actually even concluded that the pattern on the blanket and comforter that we found uh, Peggy wrapped in was made from uh, uh, for the southern states and was most likely used for motel chains in the 60s and 70s so there, there was obviously a connection there. Uh, Jerry Fletcher uh, is not uh, one to be um, not involved in violence. He was actually arrested by the Tampa Police Department on February 18, 1972 for the abduction of a 16-year-old female from the Tampa area. So right around that same time frame, he was uh, arrested for that charge, and he went to trial, and he was found guilty on June 28th of 1972. Again, right around the same um, <clears throat> around the same time as uh, uh, Peggy was found. He did leave Florida and he traveled to Illinois for his job at Caterpillar. Uh, he was married to a Sophia uh, Lucille Hughes in 1973 and he listed Gloria Espinoza who he was married to in 1965 as his one and only previous marriage. So he never talked about, never put any documentation down that he was actually married to Peggy despite their marriage license uh, in the 70s. He never reported her missing and he never mentioned her to anyone. On about April 19th of 1973, Jerry Lee Fletcher also in Illinois, murdered a Shirley McCune, and um, her body was found in a cemetery in Marshall County, Illinois, and she was raped, strangled, and disposed of in a wooded area, and she too, that victim, was wrapped in a blanket. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, in June of 2011, uh, so within the last uh, 13 years or so, 14 years, uh, Pinellas County Detective Michael Bailey, who actually volunteered for us for a time uh, within the last few years, he actually got a DNA hit in Pinellas County in 2011 on a 1971 abduction, rape, and murder of a 14-year-old girl, Gina Justy. Justy was raped. She died from blood force trauma and strangulation. And she was also wrapped in a blanket and disposed of in the Palm Harbor area in an orange grove in 1971. So again, a couple years before our body was found. <clears throat> the D DNA profile was that of Jerry Fletcher. In June of 2011, David Bailey actually went up to visit Mr. Fletcher in prison in Illinois. And there Fletcher admitted to additional murders in Florida but because he was not given uh, the assurance that he would not face the death penalty by uh, Pinellas County prosecutors, he refused to give additional information on those murders that he admitted to. He, unfortunately, for justice, Mr. Flesher died in 2014. So uh, the justice he's faced now is with his creator. It's not gonna be by a man-made court system. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly enough, and Detective Logan could probably talk a little bit about this more, but he actually interviewed the two former wives of Mr. Fletcher, a Gloria Moody, who's also known as Gloria Espinosa, and she was married to Fletcher in 1965, and uh, Matilda uh, Rigsby, who was married to Fletcher around 1968. Both of those ladies 
said that he was very violent, he was very abusive, and both women believed that Fletcher was going to kill them if they did not leave him. And of course, they did leave him fearing for their wives. On May 24th of this year, Detective Logan also went uh, and interviewed a state prison inmate, a James Owens, who was actually a cellmate of uh, <clears throat> Fletcher. And he, he actually believed that Fletcher was a contract killer and spoke of other murders, but unfortunately would not provide any details, specifics about those murders, uh, Peggy or otherwise. But because of the other murders that he was involved in, the similarities, uh, we did close this case out recently. Uh, as the death of the offender, we believe we have identified the appropriate person and we've made notifications and de uh, Detective Logan to talk a little bit about that, about the family members of Peggy, letting them know that we do have her identified and that we believe we know who was responsible for her death. So I'm going to turn it over to Detective Logan to maybe add some, fill in a little bit of interesting details about his investigation over the last uh, dozen or, or 10 years or so, and I think you'll find it pretty interesting. So, Detective. Thank you, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. You guys see the picture up there? That's, you see the recreations, the picture to your far side is obviously a real person. That's our victim, Peggy Joy Shelton. And then the recreation done by Face Logics, which I think is really spot on. Not that the clay recreation isn't a good uh, rendition of her as well. The, these people do this work based on the facts we provide, information from the report, and then they, just the mind little knowledge of it is they take a 3D image of the actual skull, they recreate it with like a polymer-based skull, and that's how they do the work for the for the claymation part of the recreation, but one of the artists who do that can tell you exactly how they do it. That's my my little snip of it. The face logics they also take into consideration all the same information they would get for the sculpting recreation, and I think they did a really good job on that based on looking at the real person in real life. Those are just some of the things that technology has afforded us in in working on these type of cases. Uh, genealogy plays a key role in, in this case as well. Um, when the body was discovered back in July of 72, shortly after that, because there was no identification, she was a Jane Doe, she was buried in our local cemetery here, Brooksville Cemetery, which uh, I just call like a potter's field, because in New York we had potter's field and that's where all the unidentified victims were. Um, so back in 2015, I, along with the state, uh, state attorney's office and the prosecutor, wrote an exhumation order to have her removed from that grave, and then we began the process of trying to get DNA on her. So once we got a full DNA profile on her, which was very difficult, because you're talking about, at this point, a 52-year-old case, the DNA degrades over time. So. I was told by the scientists that the degradation level of the DNA was high, so it was very difficult to get a full profile. However, University of North Texas, who no longer does that um, DNA for the country, they were able to get a full profile. It went into the national database, but there was no associations there because the woman wasn't a criminal and she wasn't ever reported missing by anybody. Fast forward through the years to genealogy, when that came online for us, we were able to, through the use of three separate labs, and I have to give full credit to Marshall University, uh, who has a cutting edge science program, and they were able to develop enough DNA there that could be utilized by the genealogy labs. In this case, Othram Labs is the one who did the final genealogy work, who ended up giving us Peggy Joyce Shelton, which was her maiden name, a married name at the time in Kentucky, where she's from was Nelson, uh, was Peggy Nelson. And I spoke to the detectives up there and, and they told me that, you know, it's a small town, a uh, very small county, but small town. She's a good per you know, was a good person from by all accounts, no criminal element, nothing here that would put this poor woman in this position. She's just a regular housewife at the time in the 60s and early 70s when she ended up leaving. Um, so through DNA, obviously genealogy, we were able to get to that point. 
And then, as the sheriff had said, we we released this information a few months back, and then I received a phone call uh, that led me to this web sleuth who informed me that she was married. Now, the family never told me she was divorced. They didn't know. Uh, again, her children at the time were seven and five when she left the house. So I've been dealing with her granddaughter. So I guess they didn't even know because they didn't tell me. Um, so through the web sleuth, thank God, we found out that she was married, which I confirmed through Hillsborough County records, and we see she was married to Jerry Lee Fletcher. Um, unfortunately, uh, she married that man who ended up, you know, killing her, obviously. Um, now on Jerry Lee Fletcher, just my two cents, I guess, on him. If anybody knows Jerry Lee Fletcher, anyone I haven't spoken to, or anybody who had a relationship with him, and were abused by him or has any further information, they can call the sheriff's office here and tell me. Uh, I can look into it to see if there's any other cases he might be associated with because his DNA is in the database, in the national database. That's how Detective Bailey was able to link him to Gina Jeffy, who was murdered back in 1971. Um, we've, we've also tried here an hour, and here I know the sheriff is one of his programs he's trying to implement here for the rapid DNA testing and anything DNA wise you got to realize in the 70s you know I was joking say so you couldn't spell DNA nobody knew about it it didn't exist it didn't come online till the late 80s and then early 90s and as it's gotten better and better you know like anything else in technology we we now just need a pen dot like a little minute amount of blood to have the possibility to identify our victim and or killer or killers. Uh, the rapid DNA program that the sheriff uh, is big on implementing here that we have online here, correct sheriff? Mm -hmm. And we have that and it's going to be a two phase thing I think eventually, but that could be very, very important for us where we have a crime occur, we have DNA evidence there, we can do a cursory search utilizing this program and be able to identify our suspect within an hour, I think it's that quick, or even quicker. Um, so that's something the sheriff can expound on because he knows a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> I just know about the technology uh, as a whole. But to get back to uh, the case here at Point, I've spoken with uh, Peggy's family. I've told her granddaughter, Heather, who I've had a lot of contact with, and her son, her surviving son, that Unfortunately, that their mother and grandmother married this man and that he is the one who killed her. Um, uh, fortunately, we're able to have a conclusion to the case and be able to give the family that bit of peace, I would say, because now their mother and grandmother, who's been missing all these years from you know small town in Kentucky, is now we brought her home. Uh, I helped with the arrangements to make sure they wanted the body cremated, and shortly the remains will be back with the family, so now they have a place on holidays or birthdays, whatever, to go, and at least they know where their mother and grandmother is, that she's not lost someplace, because that's where she's been for nearly five decades. So um, I guess that's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, we'll answer a couple questions. I, uh, Detective Logan brought up rapid DNA, just uh, so for your background. Uh, uh, last year, I finished my term as being president of the Florida Sheriff's Association. One of my uh, 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 pilot programs, uh, one of my initiatives that I had in place was to start a pilot program for rapid DNA in booking stations. So as it stands now, anybody who's arrested for a serious crime in Hernando County and several other counties in the state, or if they're here in the country illegally and they're arrested, Again, it's only for arrestees at this point in time. Their DNA is taken, <clears throat> and probably about 80% of the time, uh, we get a green light on that DNA, and we know it's in the system within about an hour and a half, a uh, nationwide system, and it's uh, uh, checked against uh, people who are wanted for murder, for rape, uh, for uh, terrorist activities, and, and serious kidnapping, I think, is the fourth one. We will have an answer in an hour and a half if they're wanted for any of those 
for an unsolved crime. And then within about 24 hours, they're checked against all the other unsolved crimes, less serious unsolved crimes, and we'll get notification uh, within hopefully about 24 hours if they're wanted anywhere in the country for any crime and their DNA is on file and they haven't been identified yet. Again, one of my uh, goals is to help work with the FBI and FDLE to get that tool to our investigators so that they can identify victims quickly and if there's suspect DNA, identify the suspect quickly because obviously the faster we can identify a suspect or a victim, um, as we talked earlier, for five decades almost, we didn't even know who this person was and it's very difficult to solve a crime if you don't know who the victim is. You don't know who they associate with or anything like that. We did follow up some leads. Obviously, they weren't, uh, they weren't, uh, they turned out to not be suspects, but over the years, we followed up some leads that uh, resulted in dead ends. But because of the DNA technology, we were able to identify her. And then through the help of some of the public and the media, we were actually able to uh, generate him as a uh, suspect in this case. So. A really good case, but a couple points here, and we'll move into our answer some questions and then move into the second phase of our um, press conference here is we never give up, and these things take time. And we don't want them to take 52 years, but at the same time, we've got to play the hand we're dealt. And uh, back in 1972, finding a body wrapped in the woods in a blanket, uh, especially. Uh, if we don't know who that person is, that is a very difficult case to solve in the 1970s. It's a little bit easier today, but it's still very, very difficult. And the faster we can get those leads, the more likely we are to solve them. So does anybody have any specific questions on this particular case before we move on? Uh, just a quick question on timeline of actually solving this. So from 2015, did it take several years to finally identify her through DNA and then was that, I would you say, tipster maybe back in the beginning of the year, the one who finally helped you crack it open? Or was any like DNA from him found with her? Was it the marriage records? So, so, so in 2015, when we began the process of getting an identification, we did develop a, a profile set to University of North Texas, UNT, and that went into the national database. But she had no criminal record and no one ever reported her missing. So there's no sign of her. When genealogy came online, I want to say it was 2019, when I began the process of sending her for genealogy testing. But because her DNA was so poorly degraded, the genealogy lab suggested we send her, her DNA to uh, Marshall University. And, and these things, it's not like it's just, it goes there on Monday and it's done on Tuesday. They had it for six or eight months to develop it. And thank God through their hard work, they were able to get a profile that now could be used for genealogy through Othram. I believe it was sometime in 2021, I think, when Othram finally gave me the information that it was, they believed it was Peggy Joyce uh, Shelton, then I reached out to Hopkins County, Kentucky, the local uh, agency where Peggy resided back in the 60s and 70s, again, small town. So it took all that time to get to that point, and then it was suspects in the case, so I didn't want to have anything released yet to have you guys help out and get it out there. But eventually when it came on and we had a press release some time ago, you, through you, the media helped out by getting it out there. Then I got a phone call actually from my volunteer, Bernadette, that was contacted by the web sleuth. The web sleuth then got in contact with me. We spoke and she sent me some information and I verified it, and she's given me a lot of information, of which some of it wasn't 100%, but she's going based on what she knows. But overall, all the information was very fruitful and helpful for us, and that's why it took so long. I mean, I, I've been working on this case, you figure, for nine years, not solely, obviously, but amongst my other cases. So it's a long process. Some cases we can get a conclusion quicker. <laughs> and did you uh, do... Um a familial DNA to, go, to verify Othram's? Did we have yeah. to get a DNA yes. from the granddaughter so or something? So when I reached out to, when I, so when once, so the process is once you get this association, I have to verify it. So when they gave me her name, I started doing my computer work here. They had done some research 
and eventually I found one of her, a whole bunch of family, but her, her son, Hugo. Uh, I got a hold of him. After speaking with him, Othram Labs will mail the kit right to that individual. He provided his DNA, mailed it back, then they tested it and got the association, which tells them that this individual, the unidentified, would have to be the mother of this person because they, it's a whole different system uh, when you deal with you deal with centimorgans, it's called, and that's how they made their association based on the numbers and the science. I can speak a little on it, but you want to, everything, go talk to the scientists, they can tell you it all. But that's how we were able to tie him in and verify 100% that that was Peggy. All right, any other questions? How long, yes. was, she, how long was she in the woods before she was initially discovered? So It was almost uh, immediately, wasn't it? Yeah, a couple of days. So we had some witnesses at the time. This happens in a rural part of our county out of a high corner road. And it actually, at the time, there's only, I think there's still only two houses on that whole block. One is occupied, and that's where these people who were the witnesses lived. It was late at night, and they believe it was July 15th. They saw a vehicle drive down the end of the road where there's no residences at all. It's actually the back of Withlacoochee Forest, I think, at that point. And four days later, on July 19th, the kid who lived in a house at the time, who's, all these people still live local, rode his motorcycle down there, conked out, and right in front of what he saw and believed was a person. He goes back and tells his family. He goes down there with, back with his brother-in-law. They discover that it is, in fact, a real person. They notify the sheriff's office, and that's how our agency gets involved on July, July 19th. So we figure she was down there for about four days. Did you? Sheriff and Detective, even one that can answer this, since Fletcher Well, that's that, that that term has been used, and I, I think uh, uh, George would probably, Detective Lurgan would probably back me up. Uh, he certainly has all the makings of that, and we know he's been found guilty of at least a couple murders, right? Correct. Uh, um, and 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 a couple other violent uh, things. So, um, does he fit the definition based on all the facts we have, the hard facts? Maybe not, but I think we can all make a conjecture that uh, we probably know of at least three murders, including this one, um, that he's uh, been arrested for, or was the other one, uh, or the, the one in Illinois was- The uh, girl in Illinois, he, he murdered her. Come up here. I will, so yes, he, we absolutely unequivocally can tell you that he murdered those two young girls through DNA. Um, and I know he murdered my victim so, based on all the findings and then when he spoke with Detective Bailey uh, back in 2011, and I know Mike Bailey personally, and he was here for a while, uh, and he told me, he told him, I, I'll tell you about the other, because Mike asked him specifically about the other Florida murders, and he said, yeah, I, I can tell you that, but he wasn't the guarantee of not getting the death penalty, so he didn't want to give them up, but he used murders and said there are other murders, so being plural, so, at that point, it, there's no doubt in my mind he doesn't fit the criteria for a serial killer. You can look at, for the FBI, I know they have their own thing, uh, but he, in my opinion, he is. One last question, just from me, uh, circling back just to everything you explained with all the DNA, the science behind this, the time, the resources that went into this, uh, of course, decades ago. Can you guys just speak to, you know, I'm sure this feels like final closure for you guys and all your work and also the family, you know, and anything else that maybe the family wants us to know about. Well, uh, it, George can speak to it too, but uh, George and I spend uh, a lot of time over the last uh, decade or so uh, talking about every cold case and where he is on it because uh, in in our, our book, it's a loss for law enforcement on every unsolved case, particularly serious cases, and uh, we certainly don't uh, like that and we take it personally. And as I said, we never give up, we never stop, and you can see just a, I mean, the tip of the iceberg of the work that was actually done by him on this case, and he has upwards of a couple dozen at times cases that he's working, some of which are cold, some of which are hot cases. Um, so you can see a lot of work goes into these cases, and it can be very frustrating for us and frustrating for the family. 
when it can take months, you send something off and it takes months to get good news, well, it also takes months to get bad news that they didn't find anything and you gotta go try your next thing. So yeah, it is, it is a, a sense of satisfaction. We're nice, it's nice for us to know. We've had a couple cases where our violent suspect has been deceased, but at least we can let uh, the family know that the person has been held accountable, spent a lot of his uh, uh, later years in prison, um, and so they don't have to worry about him running around scot-free, not being held accountable. So I don't know if you want to talk about that too, about some of the cases you've solved and talking specifically with the families and some of their reactions. Well, all I can tell you is that, and I've been fortunate, I'm fortunate first of all that we have a cold case unit and the sheriff lets me work the cold cases. Uh, I think I mentioned it in the past because there's always so much current crime, unfortunately, that that's usually where a lot of the resources and time and and manpower goes, uh, and rightfully so. But we can't we can't forget our victims in the past because yesterday's victim is already in the past. And if we don't solve it and work it, we're not doing the justice for the families. We're not keeping the community safe by taking a guy like this off the street. Um, I can tell you from talking to a lot of the families of my victims over the years. Uh, they're very happy and thankful that it finally came to a conclusion, but it's, it's bittersweet. We can't bring their loved one back, so that's never going to change. I just try to hold the bad guys accountable, and if we can get them into prison, that's great, because that's where they belong. Uh, and in most of the cases and the, the murders that I've had from in the past, they've had more than one victim that I got them from. So w once these guys commit murder once, it's m a lot easier for a second time, third time. Uh, but to stay on point with the families, they, they're very appreciative of everything, all the work that goes into it. And they only know if you can, if you get the report and it's released and say, oh, gee, there's 100 reports. Hey, there's 800 reports. There's a th I mean, that's a lot of reading, but that's all the work that went into it. There's a lot of man hours that go into it. Just think to yourself, if you're working on a story and it's this giant story and you're working on it forever, well, that's what these cases are. You. You put your blood, sweat, and tears into them and your heart and soul, and uh, they're tough because you get attached. These are people that have been victims for years, and I have a long-term relationship with the families of the victims. So it's some of them waiting for justice, and I've been able to provide that to some of them. The other ones are still waiting, but I'm only one person, uh, so we keep moving ahead. But they're, very, they're always very appreciative, and. And it's like I said, it's bittersweet because now all these memories come back up of their loved one uh, when this comes to light, and now you know, relive it in a sense again. So it, it's like I said, bittersweet. It's tough. Can you spell your first and last name for us? Yes, my first name is George G E O R G E, last name Lloyd Gren, L O Y D G R E N. Thank you. You're welcome. And he's a uh, major case slash cold case detective, uh, has been for almost a decade. And, you know, I, uh, as I said, we spend a lot of time talking about these cases. And uh, I have to kind of live, as I say, live a little bit vicariously through him because I find what he does uh, extremely interesting. And I try to give him the resources he can within reason uh, that I can rather to uh, bring these cases to closure. And uh, we try to use technology whenever possible. Uh, as we said, it takes a long time and it can be very expensive, but I think it's certainly worth it to, uh, to take that mystery out of a particular case. Um.